that I should thank uh, Jean Louis for this kind invitation. It is always a pleasure to be here. And in my first talk, I will develop uh, the issue of the management of hyponatremia in patients with edema. That, uh, for an hepatologist as I am, means uh, to treat uh, hyponatremia in patients with cirrhosis and ascites. That is, by definition, an hypervolemic hyponatremia because uh, usually patients with cirrhosis develop hyponatremia only after the development of ascites. Almost 96% of the cases of hyponatremia in patients with cirrhosis uh, occur in patients with ascites. So we decompensate the cirrhosis. And you know, not only this, but the probability to develop hyponatremia in this patient is strongly related to the severity of the ascites. So if a patient has a difficult to treat ascites, a refractory ascites, if a patient requires frequently large volume paracentesis, the probability to develop hyponatremia is much higher. Well, what about the prevalence? In, in patients with cirrhosis, uh, around 60%. In outpatient, around 40%. As a mean, uh, around 50%. That is uh, a prevalence much higher than that of hyponatremia in patients with chronic heart failure. Because in this patient, the prevalence is reported up to 30%. The probability to develop hyponatremia in cirrhotic patients with ascites is uh, 40% at one year and 37% at five years. Let me go briefly inside the pathogenesis because here the problem is not a defect in sodium body weight. The problem is an excess in total body water. And this is related to the fact that patients with decompensated cirrhosis are not able to produce and to eliminate free water. So the clearance of free water is much lower as compared to patients with compensated cirrhosis as compared to patients, sorry, to healthy subjects. And you know, the reduced capacity of cirrhotic patients to produce and to eliminate free water is related to three main factors that are the increased plasma level of vasopressin, the reduced delivery of sodium to the diluting segment of the ends loop and the reduced production of prostaglandin, particularly PGE2 in the kidney, because PGE2 counteracts the effect of vasopressin on the principal cell in the collecting duct. I have no time to go into each point, but let me focus on the increased plasma level of vasopressin. So, this is related mainly to an increased secretion of vasopressin, as you can see. This is uh, the plasma level of co pectin that is co-secreted with vasopressin in patients with decompensated cirrhosis as compared to patients with compensated cirrhosis. Of course, so there is also a contributory effect of the reduced hepatic metabolism of vasopressin in patients with advanced liver disease, but the main problem is the increased secretion of vasopressin in this patient. And this is related not to an osmolality problem, because we can reduce osmolality in this patient through a water load without changing the plasma level of vasopressin. The problem is a reduction of the effective central blood volume because if you can increase in any way the effective central blood volume, you can see that the plasma level of vasopressin are strongly reduced. Well, let me go on. Why there is a, an increased secretion of vasopressin in patients with decompensated cirrhosis? Because there is a reduction of the effective circulating volume due to splanchnic arterial vasodilation that is the direct consequence of portal hypertension and liver failure. In heart failure, it is quite the same. The difference is uh, the uh, driving factor that is the reducing cardiac output. 
Let me go on speaking about the mechanism of uh, impairment of the free water clearance uh, at the collecting duct level. Of course, vasopressin links uh, to the B2 receptor, and so there is an activation of PKA, and this uh, makes it possible the exteriorization of aquaporin 2 that are water channel then make it possible for water to enter into the cell and to be transported to the basolateral membrane and then to the interstitial fluid. Let me go now into the treatment because we have a lot of options, you know? Reduce water intake, white drawal even temporarily of diuretics, saline, vatan, albumin, albumin plus vasoconstrictor. Let me go briefly inside each of them. Reduce water intake. To reduce the water intake in cirrhotic patients to less than one liter per day is not effective. The only result that you can avoid the further reduction of the serum sodium concentration, but we cannot correct hyponatremia. In addition, the patients are not compliant with this suggestion because despite they are surrounded by a lot of water, ascitic edema, they are thirsty because all the mechanism of thirst are activated in this patient. What about uh, temporary withdrawal of diuretic and saline? The temporary withdrawal of low diuretic should be always considered. Saline should be considered only in two clinical settings. The first is uh, the severe neuropsychiatric syndromes, that means uh, grade 2 or 4 hepatic encephalopathy or an imminent liver transplantation. Why? Because the presence of hyponatremia at the time of liver transplant has a negative impact on survival after liver transplantation. Let me speak about Bartans. The rationale is strong because if you, with what we obtain with, with Bartan is to avoid the link of vasopressin to the B2 receptor. <coughs> now I will speak about two compounds, satavaptan and tolvaptan. So satavaptan was very effective in correcting hyponatremia in patients with cirrhosis as compared to the restriction of uh, water intake. Satavaptan was also able to improve the management of uh, refractory acidity when it was given together with diuretics. But, uh, you know, in a long-term study, satavactan in increased the mortality rate as compared to placebo in cirrhotic patients with decompensated cirrhosis when it was used together with diuretics. And so the development of this drug was stopped. What about tolvactan? These are two similar clinical trial study with the same ascending level of tolvactan in patients with cirrhosis, in patients with heart failure, in patients with uh, syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. The drug was given for one month and you can see that it was very effective in both studies in improving the serum sodium concentration. But when we look inside the study, you can see that the Tolvata was able to correct hyponatremia at day 4 and day 30 only in 41% and 33% respectively of patients with decompensated cirrhosis. And if we look to the extension of the salt 1 and salt 2, that is the salt water, a study in which uh, Tolvata was given for more than two years, you can see that in cirrhotic patients, the correction of hyponatremia was less frequent than in patients with chronic heart failure and in patients with the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. So this is our own experience. These are patients with refractory ascites that were treated with tolvactam for a severe hyponatremia. And you can see that uh, the increase in serum sodium concentration was obtained in almost 25% of the patient, but only in one of them, the hyponatremia was fully corrected. So 
what happened uh, with Tolvatan? It was licensed in the US, it was licensed in Europe, in Japan and in Korea. But please take care that in the US and in Europe it was licensed only for the treatment of a rapidly progressive autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Why not in patients with hyponatremia? because uh, there were some cases of severe liver toxicity. So, only in Japan and in Korea, Tolvatan was licensed for the treatment of hyponatremia in cirrhotic patients and in, pa in patients with heart failure, and uh, which were the result of post-marketing studies in this country, very controversial. This is a study which Tolbata was given only for seven days, it appears able to correct hyponatremia up to one month, up to three months, but if we look to the result in terms of survival, no effect in all patients, and no effect as compared to placebo in patients with hyponatremia. So what about albumin? Well, we have only one abstract showing that albumin may be useful in the treatment of uh, hyponatremia and decompensate the cirrhosis. Now we have a retrospective study showing that if patients with decompensated cirrhosis were treated during the hospitalization with albumin, the probability to correct hyponatremia is much high, is higher than in patients who did not receive albumin during the hospitalization. What about uh, albumin plus vasoconstrictor, a strong rationale? because we are improving the effective circulating volume. So you can see that mitodrine with albumin was capable to normalize the serum sodium level, the serum level of vasopressin. And you know, mitodrine is able to improve the treatment of refractory ascites in patients with cirrhosis. That is not the case of Tolvacta. What about terlipressin, that is a powerful arterias planknic vasoconstrictor. Well, in patients uh, with cirrhosis that are treated with terlipressin for a variceal bleeding, terlipressin per se may induce hyponatremia because it has an effect on the V2 receptor. But this occurs only in patients without ascites. In patients with ascites, when terlipressin is used together <coughs> with albumin, the combination is able to normalize uh, the concentration of sodium in the plasma. So this is what we have on the treatment. We have something else on the prevention. This is uh, the answer study, a multicenter Italian study, randomized, uh, in which we compare the standard medical treatment for responsive ascites, that is, uh, dietary sodium restriction and diuretics versus the standard of care and the long-term infusion of albumin, 80 grams per week the first two weeks and then 40 grams per week up to 18 months. And in this trial we proved that the long-term infusion of albumin was able to reduce the probability to develop refractory ascites Was able to reduce the probability to develop all type of infection, but also of hyponatremia. And for all these results, we were able to prove that the long-term infusion of albumin was capable to improve survival. So we have something better to prevent hyponatremia in decompensated cirrhosis than to treat hyponatremia in decompensated cirrhosis. Because my conclusion is that hyponatremia in decompensated cirrhosis is still an orphan clinical condition without a specific effective treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.